And we are live. Welcome to episode, what number is this again? I should look. <laughs> it's 230. Wow. So awesome. The um, hot sauce I haven't talked about in a little while, so I thought I'd bring that up first. And uh, it's the Trey's Chili, T-R-E-S Chili by Jess Hales Serendipity. This is actually a pretty cool sauce. Uh, someone sent us a whole lot of this, and uh, it it's really good. So we got sent this um, from one of our clients. They were like, hey, you guys like hot sauce. Let me focus. There we go. Uh, maybe. Uh, close enough. We can zoom in. We have the technology. There we go. Uh, you can find this online, though. Though It's a pretty good hot sauce. I've We've consumed quite a bit of it. They sent us more than I thought we would consume, but turns out it's really good, and we started consuming. It's not particularly hot, but, um, you know, it's good sauce. That's that's what matters is that it's got good flavor. I didn't put a lot because I've got about 30 minutes uh, before I have to be to the next thing I have to do today. Um, oh, and I see Eric already commenting in the comments. Uh, yeah, one of my staff did come and... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he came and grabbed some. We shared it all amongst the staff. Actually, that's the button I'm looking for. Make the chat bigger. So there we go. I'm getting better at all of this uh, handling it. So figure out how to size things. Actually, this is a weird part is how you size this. Let me make the chat more readable. All right. There we go. Awesome. All right. Um but lab things is what I was going to talk about today is we've been doing some testing and a few people had had questions. And one of those questions was about like the TrueNAS core and uh, I, Miles internally has been doing some testing with TrueNAS core, TrueNAS scale. It looks like it's not a problem so far to uh, import and move your data sets from one side to the other. So that's not a big deal. So definitely... Um, that it's going to be what everyone asked because one true NAS scale and I posted a picture on Twitter and right away, even Wendell commented, like, he's like, that's exciting that it's coming out. And the next thing is going to be is what I do with all my data, because I don't want to have to rebuild my data sets or rebuild things or anything like that. And uh, you won't have to, you, you will be able to uh, pull and import your data from one spot to another. So that part's great. So I'm excited about that right there. I also, um, have ordered a uh, to, to, to do the new Unify aggregation 25 gig switch. A few people asked about it and I'm like, I'm just going to order one um, to review it because there's a few things I wanted to test with 25 gig, including uh, Synology. I was just on a conference call with them today, um, learning some of the details of some new product offerings they have. So that's kind of cool. Uh, yes. And someone mentioned RAID Z expansion is coming. We'll see how quick RAID Z expansion gets here, but it may take some time. I'm excited that it's developing, but you got to remember um, any product rush too soon when it comes to data integrity would not be well received or well trusted if it did not go well. So I would expect some uh, lots of testing and a slow uh, cycle before we get RAID Z expansion in ZFS. I, I think it's coming. I don't think it's getting here fast. That's the best way I can describe that. And I see my son is in here commenting that he would like pizza. Yes, Marcus, I will drop off a pizza on my way. Hey, Travis, good to see you in here. And uh, upgraded to 10 gig. Yes. And then I'm going to do some 25 gig videos, which is means you're going to want to upgrade to 25 gig because, you know, 10. 10s last year. No, I'm kidding. Um, 10 gig is actually, it's been around a while. It's more recently become affordable. The 25 gig steps the game up in price quite a bit because the, the challenge is the cards are a lot for the 25 gig. Um, none of them are really all that cheap is the best way I can describe it. So because there's a cost uh, prohibitive nature of buying the cards. Now the good news as far as form factor, when they're DAC, uh, direct attached copper, it's the same physical form factor as the SFP and SFP plus um, electrically. It's going to be electronically slightly different. Uh, so it is going to be some, it'll be some talking points I have when I do that video. So I can kind of explain for people thinking about going to the 25 gig hookups, how you can achieve that, what you have to do to achieve that. Um, you know, and like I said, it is slowly becoming uh, more affordable. Oh, and the noise of a 25 gig switch. Yeah. 
that's going to always be a factor if you're trying to do it in a home lab. Um, for us, it's not really an issue because it's not going to be a lab device. Uh, 25 gig when we put, you know, buy some 25 gig cards and some 25 gig hookups. Uh, it's all part of a bigger plan. I need to build another rack and uh, we have more servers than I've kind of running out of room for things. So, um, yeah, that's going to be on a to-do list as well to have a separate rack where all that stuff lives. Uh, so, yeah, you know, just kind of the evolution of things. Uh, yes. Um, ordering the right cards. Yes. <laughs> That's always a challenge. Um, the other thing I'm working on and been messing with is the, and I'll get this pulled up in another window real quick here. Where do I pull that up? Probably over here. Um, the 45 drives, uh, Houston OS. They've actually done a lot of cool things with it. Let me fire it back up. I just shut it down. I think it's powered off. Is it? Or is it still on? Yeah. Oh, good. It is. It is powered on. Perfect. So I can share the screen with you. One second here. Always detail, details, details. 45 drives. Get logged in and I'll switch screens. There we go. So stop the sharing here. Uh, Oh, how do, how do most uh, PCs handle 25 gigs as of now? They can. It's a matter, it, it, it's not really that necessary until you have like an off-flash storage array. So it's kind of because perhaps I have some off-flash storage arrays that may be showing up that I need to do some testing with is why I need this. Uh, but that's usually, you're not going to, it's hard to saturate it until you get something like a really fast storage system. And of course, then you have to have a really fast uh, hypervisor, for example, uh, is something that's going to target that storage. So it's kind of a combination of things that you need to make that work. It's not just a matter of uh, getting the 25 gig hookup. It's the 25 gig hookup along with the um, have, having the whole, you know, everything you need, all the different pieces. Because once you start up in the game for things to be that fast, everything in between needs to get that fast as well. Uh, but this is the 45 drives system. And let me swing the screen over here. There we go. Um, the Houston OS has gotten a lot better. Now, yes, I know it's cockpit, but one of the things um, is going to be, uh, <laughs> no, certainly not going to peer storage. I'm going to throw that out there. Uh, peer storage is cool, but not that cool. Not as cool as, you know, the offerings from 45 drives, the offerings from Synology and the offerings from TrueNAS. So I don't really plan on adding um, uh, just, pure storage to my list of things right now. Matter of fact, I know a few people that don't care for it as much. Um, one service has failed. Yeah, that happens sometimes. Let me see what service was it. Okay, these drives are online. Anyways, the Houston system is another thing we've been playing with a lot in the lab. I've been working on some new and updated videos. And what they've been doing is uh, just a real good list of updates they've got. Um, they now have the, let me show you like the file navigator. This is really cool. So we can go here to mount, refresh. Oh, I don't have anything mounted there. <laughs> Wrong one. I got it mounted here. My bad. So I can actually go inside right in here in the cockpit manager and manage files. I think this is cool. They're really working on like a lot of neat stuff over there. So I wanted to, I'm going to probably do a few updated videos because what the first video that needs to be done though, is why would you use this over something else? And that's going to be one of the videos I'll probably have done tomorrow is kind of the use case for why you might want to take a look at the way they're doing it. Because the question comes up all the time is what NAS software should I use or should I roll my own? And, that is a fun question and it's not an easy answer, but over at, and I think I have it bookmarked, I'll pull it up real quick. Do, 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 do. Well, I can do this. There we go. I'll find the comment on it. There we go. Scroll to the beginning and switch tabs. Share, share screen, Chrome tab. It'll be this one here. 
This is something over at Level 1 Techs in our forums. And I can drop a link to this if anyone's interested. But what you have here is the custom use case you run into for something like the 45 Jives platform. And, you know, Wendell is going pretty far with what he plans to build. So first thing is a Steam cache, LAN cache he wants to set up on this. So that obviously requires a lot of storage. So he's going to build that in there. Um, he's going to load Portainer. Uh, to manage some of the images and some of the containerization that's going to be on there. Uh, he also has a good write-up here on how to get a few other things working, a few quality of life improvements, you know, including how to configure Samba so it properly does this. And this is something, yes, you can do in TrueNAS, but it's uh, configurable via Samba. So here's how to set that up on here. Then we go a little bit further and it's into this part here. It is the multi-pathing RDMA and he's got some configuration details uh, that Wendell broke down on there as well. So this is where you start getting really those out of the box configurations and where I think the uh, 45 drives platform might be pretty popular because it's just running Ubuntu. There's nothing special about it, but it's Ubuntu with a ZFS manager on top. And that ZFS manager, because <clears throat> you can load ZFS on Ubuntu, that's step one. But then how do you manage a lot of drives? ZFS can be managed from the command line, but if you don't do it all the time, you're not as familiar with those commands. So I like that kind of hybrid of offering, here's a cool way to manage all your drives and manage some of the you know, tedious functionality that you don't use too often. But then under the hood, you still have full access to the real powerful of running Ubuntu underneath. And Cockpit has uh, been one of the web UIs I've recommended to a lot of people because unlike Webmin, it's very... Uh, much in line with the way you use Linux. And what I mean by that is it doesn't create any weird config files. It's reading from all the normal config files, not trying to create a separate instance of them or a special way for doing it. So everything you do is kind of all in all one and the same, whether you adjust something inside of cockpit or you adjust it from the command line, you're not breaking anything. It's all just reading it all in real time. <clears throat> um, there's not a way I can recommend a number of NAS drives for a MSP business. It's all based on how much storage you need. So I get I get the question, but you're kind of coming at it from the wrong angle. How much storage do you need? How much storage do they have? So you so say you have 500 gigs of data, but I want to get that data off to your local systems. It, same thing. You okay? 500 gigs. You need at least 500 gigs, but you also probably should keep revisions of it. So, how many revisions do you need to keep? So, you're going to need, you know, several terabytes to keep revisions of it and storing it locally. That's kind of a challenge because you become a single point of failure. So, you may want to look at a cloud solution as well as storing the data yourself. So, that's uh, definitely something to consider. Corey Thompson, 26th wedding anniversary often awesome 26 years congratulations that is that is great always good to see you know people uh people making it the the long haul there smash the like button too so that definitely a thing uh and i do see that uh, kyle dropped a link to the synology and let's see that's actually a pretty good one there's the synology raid calculator this is definitely uh, something to take a look at. Is uh, the Synology platform is really nice, even from the uh, MSP standpoint. And trust me, Synology has all kinds of new cool stuff that's coming out. So uh, if you jump on their platform, uh, we highly recommend it. We use a lot of Synology in the MSP space and consulting space, especially for people that are looking for having a lot of their data local. Not everything needs to go in the cloud. Uh, Synology and their C2 backup system, I've done reviews of them, are a pretty solid system. <clears throat> Uh, so 231 revisions is fine. I do have it in the cloud, but it mirrors from a separate partition. Uh, yeah, build yourself a RAID system. Um, you know, I mean, I like going all out with the 45 drives, but you're 
your budget may not like going out all out with a nice 45 drive server. Uh, it kind of depends. There's different. This is one of the reasons we don't offer a single product line because not every product line fits every scenario. And this is why we have so many things going in the lab, so many things in testing. So it, one, we can help people and consult with them ideas and knowing a diverse amount of products out there, such as Synology, such as 45 drives or such as the IX systems TrueNAS line is kind of a, you know, part of the fun way to do it. I got to admit though, it's fun playing with the Synology raid. I like their, I like the way this works. It's just kind of cool. Raid calculator. Put raid 10, raid F1. What's F1? Not either way, kind of cool. Look at all these drives. Take them out. Watch the raid shrink. These these just give I want to be able to press the power button and make it do something. <laughs> but Nonetheless, uh, the RAID calculator, the more challenging part is going to be the NAS calculator when it comes to uh, all these drives. So, <laughs> yeah, like Kyle says, even if you don't use the, uh, the Synology is a great calculator to uh, figure out, check RAID sizes for sure. Because um, the other one is obviously like using the ZFS um, calculator that there's, you, you have to calculate based on the um, number of drives, type of RAID, what num what, what amount of parity. Uh, there's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Lots to think about. I do, the, the selection tool they have here is pretty cool though. The level one text forum. Anyways, I, uh, I'll drop a link real quick to the level one text forum. I think I can drop it here. Anyone that's interested in looking at what Wendell's doing on his write-up on here and some of his enhancements. And this is all just Ubuntu stuff. You don't have to have a 45 drive server for any of this. This is, um, but something we've been playing with in the lab. Uh, what else we hear? Oh, RAID F is for SSD uh, wear leveling. Okay. Interesting. Lots to play with. So many things to play with, never enough time to play with them all. <laughs> I actually, one of the things I like is uh, Wendell in his review. I like that he gets into the details uh, when he was covering the 45 drive server. Uh, he found kind of an interesting way the backplane was connected. So he kind of broke down um, this right here. And yes, I like when you're breaking down block diagrams of how they did the interconnects. So... Uh, yeah, fun stuff. I also, a lot of people have asked me about this and I haven't really done much with it. Uh, configuring containers, supporting Podman. Podman looks pretty cool. And, uh, there's another YouTuber who does a lot of good videos on it. I've talked to him before and, uh, so it's something else. I think it's a kind of a cool idea. And of course this kind of swings back around to, uh, talking about, true NAS scale and the fact that it'll be able to run Docker containers and everything else is going to get, you know, once you kind of move over to the Linux world from the uh, BSD world, there's a lot of handy stuff that starts showing up in there. All right, back to the, whoops, video phone. No, I want to share the screen tab. There you go. All right, back on this. Now, I'm still working on it. I, I, I've been behind because so many things kind of happened at once. I took some time off. I took actually a few days and just went out of town. And you follow me on Twitter. I'll randomly post there and things like that. Um, so it's taking a while for me to catch up with everything. So I haven't done as many videos. And yeah, kind of sorry about that because I know I wanted to get a couple of videos out today. And it kind of just didn't happen. Uh, that and between the consulting bookings and things like that. But uh, I am still actively working on showing off our lab and how that's wired. I wonder if I have an updated drawing or how far off this one is. Open existing. Uh, oh, I don't have the updated lab. Oh, I got this one. Let me see if this one's worth sharing. Mm, a little bit. Getting closer, so I'll share a screen on this one here. 
Actually, I got to close that. That I was running Windows XP before uh, I opened this. I'm closing my Windows XP machines. <laughs> I, I still, I won't lie, I'm still using um, Windows XP because of the fact that it's it's how we print our checks here. <laughs> there we go, I'll share this. This is the lab drawing that I have to update a little bit of how everything is and how the containers work and everything else. Uh, well, not containers, but the uh, virtual machines and how we work the VLANs I'm on there. And of course, I got to add the 25 gig switch that'll be here soon. That'll be in this mix as well. Um, other cool things I like is the fact that the draw.io uh, now supports animations. So I can choose animation as a type in the properties. Um, it's going to be under their property value. And you just choose flow animation. So we'll do it here. And you can create flow animations for each one of the different connectors in here. That's going to be kind of a fun. I thought about making when I do my updated um, drawings for all this. I'll put some flow animations in there because it just it makes it look kind of neat how the data is going. Uh, kind of related to this, though, is going to be some more VLAN videos because I want to do more explanation for ways you can use VLANs for your lab because that's the um, one of the really interesting use cases that sometimes confuses people is how we have these specific VLANs and like the ones that are for our lab, they're called Studio VLAN 100 and 200. What they allow me to do is create a virtual machine here and bring a port out anywhere we want in our studio, for example, and route back and forth. So I can take a firewall externally, like a physical one I'm doing testing with, plug it into a port and then create a VLAN where some virtual machines live behind it or just create that VLAN to uh, manage the other systems that are in between. Uh, who uses checks anymore? That's, that's actually funny. I wish I didn't, but it is still the easiest way to uh, pay a lot of things here in America. So, yeah. For all the bills and online pay and things like that, that's fine. But for uh, paying vendors, uh, it's still easier than paying with ACH. So there's that. Keep an XPVM working, those old Java base uh, are Lilo system. Yeah, I know that too. Some of the old Super Micros had that as well with the uh, stupid Java interfaces that you had to do for the lights out management. And it was just like, uh, yeah. The check writing software I'm using is VersaCheck, and I have I took my Windows XP and I cloned it into a virtual machine, specifically VirtualBox, back in, I don't know, 2007 maybe? Who knows? Long time ago, and uh, maybe before then. Anyways, it's been there ever since, and uh, so I just fire it up when I need to. Uh, the drawing program I'm using is draw.io or diagrams.net. So... Uh, draw.io and diagrams.net's the same thing. I have a whole review on it. It's a great drawing program. I use it for quite a few things. Um, do I have, like I just did this video in here with sync thing. I did it with this. I mean, it's just really simple for setting these up. Oh, you know, it's kind of funny. I messaged uh, on Twitter, Steve Gibson, because I know he's a sync thing user. So I messaged that this existed. And he mentioned it in his thing, but he says, oh, and, and, and someone sent me this. And that's all he said. He didn't say my name. I was like, aw. <laughs> I found to get a shout out on security now. <laughs> so such is life. Uh, Draw.io works cross-platform. I think that's what you're asking. Are Pi-Hole is still enabled for new PFSense install? I'm not sure um, because I don't really use Pi-Hole, but PF Blocker, when you set up PF Blocker, as far as I know, it still supports the same feeds. I, I could be wrong because I don't use Pi-Hole, uh, but there's plenty of ad blocking feeds uh, that are used within uh, PF Blocker that should be completely compatible um, the other way around. Uh, I see people saying, can you go on library? The answer is no. 
Um, I have a post on my, if you look at, look for uh, talking about library. There's a post on my forum about it where I explain why I don't waste my time with it. Uh, you know, I, I guess I do have a question. A few people did ask this and I don't know if this is something I'll, Jay started doing it and we're trying to decide if it's something I want to do as well. Jay from Learn Linux TV, it's offering a, uh, if you want an ad free version, cause you don't want to watch it on YouTube, then you can pay us through Patreon and we can upload them to Vimeo. This is not something we're doing right now, but it's something Jay started doing and I thought about doing it as well. So I thought it might be kind of a neat thing, but it, you know, I, I, I'm not trying, it costs money for me to put them on Vimeo as part of how that works. Uh, it takes time to put them on other platforms. So you got to still figure out ways to pay for all the time it takes and the tech investment for doing all these things. I don't know if there's a big interest in that or not. I'm just throwing it out there. If there was cool, it's not hard to do, but it's one of those things that I'm not really sure if there's enough people interested in there. So, I mean, I don't have a problem. Jay, Jay's getting more people that view it. The other option is, of course, you know, where you put special content out there, but I kind of don't like trying to hide all my content behind a paywall. Um, I don't know. It, it, trying to figure out the path forward on that is always, uh, you know, tricky to do. I get some people don't want to deal with YouTube. That's fine. You don't want to deal with the ads on YouTube and you don't want to buy a, uh, um, you don't want to buy a subscription to YouTube. You don't want to give the big bad Google company money and that's fine. But you know, the, the exchange that Google's offered allowing creators uh, and people tolerating some ads or giving some money to avoid the ads has become a pretty good way to get a lot of information, which is why YouTube's so popular. The other platforms, and as someone pointed out, uh, because they're based on cryptocurrency and I've pointed out a few times, this is where I have a whole write up in my forums, even some of the bigger YouTubers that have tried putting their content over there, they don't get any views. They get very little engagement on there. And these are channels with like 5 million subscribers that can't get a thousand views on Odyssey. It's just, and you know, trying to monetize any of that and the trouble it takes to upload all that. It's like, look, you know, we want to get paid for your content at some point and it, they, they don't make it easy. Um, oh yeah. Thank you, Eric. Eric posted that in the, uh, chat so now the forum link it says will you join odyssey is the <laughs> yes that's that forum post right there i i break it all down and so i don't have to repeat myself i send people that link quite a bit that's uh that's only a lot of times my goal sometimes when i do a video so i don't have to repeat uh repeat myself but i've had it in a forum post for a little while uh we aren't giving anything away today i forgot to mention that um we did pick a winner i have to email that person cuz i we picked the winner today for the other uh for giving me the cisco we we got to figure out what else i want to give away we got to like sort things out a little bit and bigger problem is uh some things are heavy that i want to give away but i don't know what to do about it because the shipping sucks uh shipping on some of these are kind of like you know 40 50 bucks so um, what's your magic for upgrading firmwares and all your PFSense without using central management? Log in and upgrade them. It's not hard to do. You can do it just by, you can upgrade them from the command line, SSH into them, or just use the web interface. It's not that big of a deal. Um, there's not that many updates. There's a few updates, three or four updates a year. So it's not, and it's not that hard. I think people make a bigger deal about it. Uh, but it is what it is. So I guess that's the question is, would people pay for the shipping? Uh, that would, it, that would probably be a way I, I, I feel weird. Cause I don't, I want to give away the stuff. Cause I don't have to do with it. Um, but yeah, I guess if people are willing to pay for the shipping, we might have some computer equipment because that's where we have the most of is big things, but big things become a problem because they just, they're too big. Well, you know, 50, 60 bucks at least for shipping. Uh, so whether or not people really want them and it's just used hardware that we have. Um, if you're local, you could come pick it up. Uh, but not, a, I think the majority of the people on here aren't local or don't want to make the road trip all the way to Detroit just to pick up some old server that we want to, you know, offload. <sighs> Sorry, a little tired. Nonetheless, I get, I'm going to be winding this down in about 10 more minutes. Uh, sorry, this is not a real in-depth one today. I didn't have too much things going, too many things going on because we got caught up actually working today. I know it's been really, all these 
work has been interfering with me getting a lot of stuff done, you know, and then Comcast created some chaos for us because that's what Comcast does, shows up at a customer's and unplugs things because it's Thursday and they felt like doing that. I, I'm not even, I'm not even clear exactly what the catalyst was for Comcast to show up, grab the cable modem, put a new one in, put it in bridge mode and bypass the router and just plug it in the switch because, you know, I don't know, it's Thursday and that's what Comcast wanted to do is create some billable hours for us. So, <laughs> you know, it's just so much fun when they do these things. Um, uh, reopen will catch up on lots of maintenance upgrade. Not really. We were still went on site and did all the maintenance and upgrades, even with things not being open, uh, nature of it. You know, you, if the, if the customer had to be open, we had to go out there and get things done. You know, it's, we were part of the essential customers, as, uh, that had to make things, we had to make things happen. That's as, that's the bottom line of it. So we did simple as that went out there and, uh, we still upgraded servers, installed wiring, cabling, and do all those things. So, uh, swing by. Oh, okay. You'll, say, you'll swing by, Tom. I missed that one right there. Oh, let's see. Kebabs at Malix. Yes, I do love kebabs. They're definitely good. Uh, no hacking news. Um, I don't know. You know, I, here's the thing I can rant about because I might do a video on this is all these people, uh, that are really, you know, want to trust VPNs and VPNs are so oversold. I thought about putting together like a super cut of all the non tech YouTubers that, are shilling VPNs. You know what I mean? Do you care about your privacy and security? You should be using a VPN, blah, blah, blah. And they're overselling it, overstating the problem. And it goes right back to the recent bust at the Anam service. And it's one of those things I've said for a long time. And I thought funny because Bruce Schneier, uh, I retweeted what he had said too, because it, it's right on point. Do you even trust these VPN providers? Because the, the whole premise of this Anam takedown, this project that was a series of criminals that were using an encrypted chat service that was actually run by the FBI was exactly how any government agency would catch people. Create a service, charge for the service, make lots of privacy claims, get all the people that want to do something that they are uh, want to hide from the government, they all flock to you. It, it's it's like the most logical way to do it rather than try to figure out who's breaking it, you know, have a service that will protect you for breaking the law. And it's funny because I, you know, this seems like the best methodology. And the fact that this went on for two years, so close to three, so he started the project in 2018 and it finally came unraveled here in 2021. And this is the, I, you know, how can you trust any of these VPN companies? Like we get a lot of people, unfortunately, that are misinformed, reaching out to us going, I need to hide my IP address from the government. And I'm like, oh God, no, no, that's, it's, what are you doing? Honestly, if you want to use VPN because you want to uh, do country bypass, that's normal. We, we get it. You're, you're torrenting. We get it. We know. Like those are fine reasons. And I don't think a, well, matter of fact, it's a matter of time before some Hollywood company simply uh, some, and I see Hollywood company, I'm specifically talking about companies that, you know, in the movie industry, because they're often terrible and have a lot of power in the media industry. They set up a VPN service so they can figure out who's trying to copy things and stuff like that. So <laughs> kind of like how Tor nodes are government run. Yeah, that's, that's, I've covered that before, and that's that's another confusing topic as well. Tor itself is good, but um, there's been a lot more attacks on Tor nodes in the last two years since I did my last video. So there's actually um, some interesting revelations for what's going on on the Tor networks and uh, how many more. And it's actually not government. It's uh, a series of criminals are spinning up Tor nodes and doing a bunch of redirects to try to get uh, snatch people's cryptocurrency. It's it's been a really there's some good write ups on it. I've tweeted them out before, but they're it's complicated. Yes, you need a VPN for Netflix when overseas. That's true. Uh, 
and the main reason of VPN is keeping people from shenanigans if you're using open Wi-Fi, but also making it harder for data aggregators to build profiles. Honestly, the data aggregators build profiles and IP address is a very weak indicator for data aggregators. Your login and your Google account are the aggregators. The IP address is irrelevant. Matter of fact, by the way, folks, all you who hate CGNAT, CGNAT are, is the reason they don't use IP addresses as a data point. It's a very weak data point. It usually just indicates region to them. It's not specific. One, even at home, there's too many devices behind a single IP address. Second, with more and more carriers, ISP is going to carry a great NAT, it becomes an even weaker data point again for who you are. Your IP address is not who you are. The other details are who you are. The cookies in your browser, that's where all of your, uh, you know, where all your data is. So it's, it's like one of those things like they they have so oversold it because it's easy to sell. So there's a lot of money in it. So they sponsor. I turned down those sponsors. There's a ton of them. It is one of the most like frequent. Every YouTuber gets offered more and more money until they say yes to a VPN company to do the uh, advertisement. And they keep just offering you more and more money. Therefore, they pitch it harder and harder of this is the only way you'll be secure if you have a VPN. And you're trying to protect yourself from shenanigans on an open Wi-Fi, hoping the VPN provider doesn't do shenanigans. You're kicking the can down the road because you're worried about someone in the open Wi-Fi doing shenanigans when someone can just as easily redirect you and do shenanigans on the VPN. You're just kicking the can of trust to a different location. And once you start realizing that, you're like, oh, wow, yeah, that's interesting. Um. IP address maps with Wi-Fi uh, SID MAC addresses. Well, this is why most devices, are, and by the way, your MAC address doesn't go past the second device. So if I take my a laptop to McDonald's, the MAC address doesn't go past the McDonald's router. The They don't have my MAC address when I go to Google. And this is where some of the conflation starts coming in. So uh, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's people often focusing on the wrong things and click a phishing link. And that's usually how they get hacked. So <laughs> I, oh, how, how is the uh, VPN on the latest Unify? I imagine it's hot garbage, like every routing function of the Unify. It's, they're just not great. It's just not a great system. We just tell people don't use it. Like if you have advanced VPN uses, don't buy a Unify. Don't, Use the USG router. Don't use the Unify Dream Machine. They are uh, empty promises forever about we're going to make it better. That's how I feel about it. So Windows 7 says hello. I just like, uh, there we go. <laughs> Windows 7 says hello. I like the name. Yeah, my boss had to CLI the VPN to get a site to site working. Um, yeah, it, it's just, there's all kinds of hacky ways you can do stuff. Uh, but yeah, I don't think so. It's not, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Can you build a locally hosted Unify controller? Yes, you can download and uh, load the software for the Unify Control yourself. Tell us how you really feel about VPNs. I know the oversold, it's going to make me safer uh, thing is what drives me nuts. Especially, you know, the non-tech YouTubers who do ad reads for VPNs. It's just, they, they don't understand. They're just reading the words. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what else do we have in here? Oh, I see my son. I think I got to get my son a pizza. Do you want pizza, Marcus? I think my son's listening probably. <laughs> and like Eric says, it's not that we don't use VPNs. There's times to use them, but using them for the wrong reason is usually where 
you know, the confusion sets in and stuff like that. I don't have time to go to Pizza Hut, Marcus. This is how I have conversations with my son live on my YouTube channel. <laughs> Yeah, VPNs are not a license for illegal activity. That is very true. Um, if, if you plan to do illegal activity, the VPN, matter of fact, there's several stories. I think I may have covered this a long, a while ago. There's several stories of VPN companies cooperating with law enforcement to track down and find people. They use, they realized the VPN, they were doing it. Then law enforcement then worked with that VPN company who didn't keep any logs, but the VPN company, the claim they had was, well, they only kept logs looking for the one person. And this is where everything starts getting kind of fuzzy real quick. Cause what do you mean one person? Well, yeah, law enforcement compelled us to turn on logging, uh, but we threw everything away except for the logs for one person. Well, this is my point. You're not paying a company that you think is helping you privately. They're not doing anything other than taking your money and slowing down your internet connection. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Yep, most people aren't using VPNs for League of Shangans. That's just smearing them. Uh, no, they're not. But they're people are using. My problem is when people are using VPNs, thinking they're getting an elevated form of privacy when they're not. That's where I, I think you're just wasting money. And I mean, maybe if you just want to donate money to these VPN companies, that's fine. And I'm the one that's wrong. I'm just trying to tell people, like, you probably aren't getting any better privacy out of this. Therefore, you may as well just not use it and save yourself a few bucks or use my offer code down below. That's how I should probably pitch all those. Like at some point, if I'm not, I do as I do, I, I have an offer code for PIA. And the reason I have it is because I can tell people with the words I use not to do it, but if you're not going to do it, I may as well make some money off it. I mean, I, I why not? I, at some point I can't convince people. Um, we've joked about this before when we've had consulting on bad ideas, we call it, where people were really insistent. They want to set things up in a weird way that we tell them not to, but you will still set it up that way because you're paying me to do it. Um, I mean, it's sometimes just the way things are. People want to learn for themselves and we'll set it up for them. Uh, I mean, I won't do anything that's going to create a massive security hole, but we've seen people uh, skip critical components in their stack that will make it less resilient. Or like, I'll set it up this way, but here's your, you know, I'll still do it, but here's where the system is most likely to fail. And it is what it is. <laughs> uh Yes, if you if a court subpoenas ISP or inner company, they will have to cooperate. Yep. Even if they claim they're in another country, that's where things get fuzzy again. They can be compelled. They can be pressured. Um, I, it's it's a very convoluted mess very quickly. And you don't need people to sign waivers. It's referred to as hold harmless. Uh, you just let people know you, you have it in document. It can be as simple as an email. I think this is where this system, you should buy a second XYZ work. We don't think you should run things in RAID 0 because it is likely to fail. But yes, we know it's faster. Therefore, we will follow your wishes and set everything up in RAID 0 for you with no backups. So no problem. We'll set it up. Here's my email that tells you why we know this is a bad idea. Please confirm that you've read that part of it. So, oh, yes. The story behind Lava Bit is a fun one, too. So that's another one that's, Yeah. Uh, Lava Bit is was a big turning point because when Lava Bit ran their email service, he had the keys to be able to uh, decrypt the email, and he was compelled by the government to keep his service running so they could use it for spying. He wanted to shut it down, so it became a really interesting legal case, uh, and it's kind of messy. So it's definitely um, one of those things. So. <laughs> Oh, let's see. I think I've answered all the major questions that are in here. I'm going to give it two more minutes. Uh, any final questions for me before I wind this down so I can grab my son a pizza and go do the next thing I got to go do? <laughs> uh,
doing the research on the company and the team has been around. Yeah, it's doing your research on the company and founders of the team is a good idea. And one use one's been around for a long time. Doesn't have misleading advertising. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, but until you actually, um, you know, it, they ran the other one for two years, the FBI one run over two years before they shut it down. So it, it's fuzzy on how well you can trust those. So yeah, best VPN is a home cloud VPN. So, yep, that's true too. <laughs> oh yes. A better micro tick question for next week. Yeah. I don't really do much for cryptocurrency. It's not my thing. I don't participate in it. That's why you don't have me talking much about the crypto stuff. Can you run PF sense with a UDM? No, no good reason to do that. I don't recommend it in any way. Pineapple pizza. I like it, but I know that's a controversial opinion there because not everybody likes pineapple pizza. <laughs> Either way, if a few of you could take a minute to hit the like button, we have 177 viewers, but only 45 likes. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Hit that subscribe button. We have, uh, this is something I got to get going again. This is the, I should probably make it bigger. So let's go here. There we go. This is a, uh, uh, actually running a little Raspberry Pi and it's running e-ink. Um, cool little project that allows me to have my uh, subscribers and stuff on this. We want to build a bigger one. I think it's a it, it's pretty novel uh, for being able to do it. So um, I might, um, if I get around to it, I might do a project video on this. I This is a Pi Zero with an e-ink display and a little 3D printed case. And uh, it's got a little Python script. Uh, Miles put this together and it, it you run the script and it updates how many subscribers on there. Now, what I like about e-ink is there's no power on this right now, but e-ink always displays, you know, when you run the script, it updates the display. E-ink does not refresh normally. So you send a refresh command to clear the e-ink. It reminds me of an Etch-a-Sketch and then it will print something back on there on the second part of the command. So it, things are static when there's no power. So it's kind of neat. Um, oh, someone says, and fair question is, uh, is there any point in getting a secondhand Cisco switch if I can just get that TP-Link managed with a better UI? If you want to learn Cisco, get a use Cisco switch. If you don't want to learn Cisco, go with something else that's probably more affordable. <laughs> so, yeah, that's probably a big one right there. I um, think that's about it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um uh, we used to, I did a video on this, the Ponagachi. There is a video I have on it. So it's the same e-ink display from the Ponagachi. We got bored with the Ponagachi. So now we move to something else. Uh, yes, used Cisco switches last forever. They are long lasting. The quality of a Cisco switch is good. It's the um, function of it. If, if you don't want to learn the UI, uh, then you don't want a Cisco switch. It's just that they have a higher learning curve to them. Um, maybe it's worth it for you. Maybe it's not. That's that's kind of a you decision. Do you want to learn the Cisco commands to configure that switch? You're going to have to learn some of the Cisco environment stuff to get it. Um, it's not that it's impossible to learn, but it does have a learning curve versus the UI is more intuitive on something like a Unify or some of the TP-Link switches. They have an easier to use UI. So it's kind of, that's more where the decision comes down to. Um, knowing I, it, yes, knowing iOS can be a struggle for some and it, that's true. And especially if you don't do it all the time, let's say you're a software dev, but you want to build your lab environment, but you're not going to be tinkering with your lab environment in terms of the networking side very often. So now you got to spend a bunch of time configuring it, or maybe you have a friend that can configure it. Those are the decisions you have to figure out. And once it's in place, great. Until it's not in place, better document what you changed or what you set up, because if it breaks, you're going to have to do it over again. So that's where things get a little bit complicated. But anyways, thank everyone for joining. I still yeah, we got 48 minutes of me. So, <laughs> um, the, oh yeah, the Cisco is at least handy for the CLI editing and things like that. But, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, check it out. I'll, I'll see you guys in the forums. See you next Thursday at my, do another live show. I'm going to be working through the weekend to get a few more videos out in between and take care. <laughs>